Jackson. Uh, it's been great nights. The last three Wednesday night, we've had some wonderful teaching. Uh, they've not left much on the bone, but um, I'm going to do my best to extract something out of the scriptures that they've left over. Um, what a great time. You know, we used to have church every Wednesday night, and uh, we always started at 7. And so it's just, um, it's just an exciting thing tonight to see all the people in the house of the Lord on a cold, rainy night and um, hungry for God. So um, I just, uh, this is really, I think, will help us maybe understand where we are prophetically as a church. Um, and something that's been rolling over in my spirit for the last uh, couple of weeks. And uh, I felt like the Lord said, go ahead and touch on this tonight and so uh, I want to talk about John the Baptist and Jesus and so we're going to take our a lot of verses that we can read from tonight but um, I want to start in the gospel of St. Luke uh, chapter 1 and uh, we're going to this is a very long chapter um, it's 80 verses uh, I used to read the New Testament through every month, and uh, I always knew when I got to the Gospels and started over that it was going to take a while that day to read my nine chapters. Um, I always liked it when I got into the epistles. Uh, John 1, John 2, John 3, Jude, you know. Now, how are you doing today? Yeah, I read a whole book of the Bible, Jude, you know, like 20 verses or something, but... Um, this is Miracle Month, and it says, Believe for the Impossible. And so we're going to share with you some tremendous things Sunday, but I want to tell you something. God has done some fantastic things for this church. And uh, you're going to see what the Lord has done Sunday, and I'm so excited about what the Lord is doing. All right, let's get into the Word of the Lord, uh, the book of Luke. Um, And I'm just going to read verse 76. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. And if you go over to the seventh chapter, verse 27, Jesus calls John. He said, he is my messenger. And so God bestows some great honor upon this man. And the reason I want to deal with John is because I believe that the church right now is in transition. And sometimes when you're in transition, you, it's hard to identify who you are because you're leaving one thing and you're entering into something else new. And so you, you, you're not at your destination and you're leaving things that are familiar. And so there is John, he is ending an old order and he is preparing for a new order. His ministry, his purpose was he was bridging two dispensations. He was bridging the dispensation of law which was very difficult to live in, and he was bringing a new dispensation onto the scene called the dispensation of grace. I don't know about you, but I am so glad that I was born in the grace dispensation and I was not born in the law because it was a very difficult thing to live in. And so um, he is the, this is very interesting about John because he is the last prophet of the Old Testament. He ends it. And one of the issues that we have in the church realm today is um, we have too many people who feel like that they're under the old order. And I want you to hear me by the Spirit. There are no Old Testament prophets. Prophets are under authority. And it's under a new church order. 
And Old Testament prophets were a different prophet. They were a different ministry. And they led nations and all of that, but they didn't have a whole lot of covering. And they were, they were moved on by God. And in the New Testament, obviously, we have prophets as part of fivefold ministry. But you cannot isolate yourself from the body of Christ. Doesn't matter what kind of office, whether you're a pastor or an evangelist. I always had a problem with evangelists that never went to church unless they were preaching. Or gospel singers that never would go to church unless they were on stage singing. My wife and I, one of the reasons our kids are saved is because when we weren't on the road on Wednesday night, we were in church. We were just regular saints because we put value on the things of the Lord. And so John is, he is the very last Old Testament prophet. And he is also, uh, in fact, Jesus said this about John. He said, there is never been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But then he made a more astounding statement. He said, but he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. So no wonder God is bringing that age to an end. And yet he has to have a man, hallelujah, who is yielding to the spirit of the Lord. And so uh, the forerunner for Christ has to be a prophet because he is declaring the future that is getting ready to happen. And only prophets do that. Apostles really don't do that. Now, there are many people that sometimes the spirit of prophecy will come on them, but the spirit of prophecy is different from the office of the prophet. And For John, hallelujah, he is declaring something that is yet to happen. This is why God has put such emphasis on the office of the prophet for the last few years is because they are declaring something that we've not yet seen happen. And most of the time when prophets prophesy, the spirit of prophecy goes forth. It contradicts everything that is going on in the natural at that time. This is why lots of people, unless you have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying into the church, you can get bogged down in your natural intellect and begin to doubt the things of the Lord. And so um, he is he is a prophet because the Spirit of the Lord is moving on him. In fact, in Luke chapter 3, verse 4, it says, As it is written in the book of Isaiah, the prophet saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And if you begin to read this, John's prophesying. He says, every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways shall be made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of the Lord. And he keeps going through this chapter prophesying. He is declaring things that nobody can get their mind around. But he said, we are coming to a time when God is going to take crooked roads and make them straight. I'm telling you by the Spirit that that prophetic word is still alive because the Bible says that when God releases a word in the atmosphere, it never goes back to heaven void. And there are so many prophetic words that have been spoken over the centuries that have not yet been fulfilled, and they are circling the earth right now. Not just present prophetic words, but words that have been spoken 100 years ago, 200 years ago, over this age. And so he is preparing the way of the Lord, and so he begins to talk about these things. John He's very interesting because he is the last prophet, but he comes from the bloodline of priests. When you read this scripture, you read the genealogy, the Bible said that both Zechariah, his daddy, and Elizabeth, his mother, came from the bloodline of Aaron. 
and Aaron was the initial high priest. And so God begins to use the bloodline of the priesthood to produce the last prophet that is going to begin to declare the way of the Lord. And so I want to camp here a little bit because this is something that's just really been rolling over in my spirit. Uh, and you go back to the book of the first chapter here in Luke and um, verse Let's, let's start with verse 10. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And if you know anything about scripture, incense is a type of prayer. And there appeared unto him, talking about John the Baptist, his father, Zechariah. There appears unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled. And fear fell on him. I would be willing to take that risk if I could see an angel. <laughs> Trouble me. <laughs> Verse 13, and the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. Now, the only reason he would have said that, it was because Zechariah was afraid that God hadn't heard his prayer. So he begins to address that. He said, Zacharias, he said, you don't need to fear. And then this is what he says. He says, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shall call his name John. So, this bridge, this last prophet, he is birthed out of intercession. And Elizabeth and Zacharias are old. So there's no telling how many years they have been praying for God to give them a son. And it's difficult when you have long-term prayers that you pray and you've not seen God in them. And the reason it's difficult is because the longer God takes, the more things die in the natural that you thought could make it happen. Because most of the time when we're asking God to do something, we already know how God should do it. <laughs> how many is guilty of that? We just need God to come into agreement. Lord, I've got it all mapped out. I just need you to make it happen. And the Lord says, my ways aren't your ways. And so, you know, Zacharias, he's 30, and then he's 40, and, and then he's 50, and he's 60. And he's somewhere around 60 because I think it was the age of 60 that they no longer function in the priesthood. And he was a, one of the 24 orders that the priests did in the temple. So he's 60 years old, somewhere around there. And Elizabeth, the Bible says she is old and her womb is barren. There are some prayers that you and I have prayed in great faith years ago that over time, we quit praying. But it doesn't mean that God has not going to answer them. And the problem is, sometimes God will wait so long that when he says he's going to do it, we doubt. And so the Lord comes to Zacharias and he says, fear not. Your wife's fixing to have a baby. And immediately, you know, he's thinking in terms of, well, I don't know about that. You know, she's, she's old, and, and there's no way that, that she can have a child. And so, uh, you know, the angel begins to tell him some things. 
And Zechariah in verse 18, he says to the angel, he says, how can I know this? He said, I am an old man, and I am well stricken in years. And he said, um, he said, my wife is well stricken in years. So now you have this situation where priesthood has been told by an angel that you're getting ready to release the prophetic. You're going to birth the prophetic, but it's going to come out of the impossible. And Zechariah says, I don't know how to be. Because everything in the natural that it could come out of is dead. God will wait most of the time till every possibility in the natural dies before he does it. And the reason he does is because he wants the glory. Because if he would come to, if, if we would come to the Lord and say, I got it figured out, here's how I want you to do it, and the Lord would do it, we'd say, you know, I did that. And the Lord's going up there. What about me? You know, I was involved. So the Lord takes you out of the equation. And so it is, it is because, see, John is birthed out of intercession. Jesus is birthed out of prophecy. Because there's too much scripture in the Old Testament that is prophesying that Jesus is going to be born. And so it's not intercession. Nobody's praying that Jesus is born. But the prophetic that has already been released thousands of years ago is now coming into a Kairos moment. And so God comes down on, see, John was the last of the prophets, but Zechariah is the last of the priesthood. Because from the moment that Jesus enters into his ministry, the Bible says about Jesus, he became our high priest. And from the moment that Christ was sacrificed, from that time on, every sacrifice that was made in the temple was illegal and unnecessary because the lamb had already been slain without sin and once and for all his blood was shed. So you and I in this hour, I love Israel, but I'm not going back under the old law. He has fulfilled that. So God's moved on this, on this priesthood that's coming to an end that needs to birth the prophetic that will prepare the way for the Lord. And because it's been so long and it seems so impossible, John, his daddy, Zachariah, says, I don't think that can happen. And he ticked the angel off. You don't want to make angels men. In fact, in the Old Testament, the Bible, Jesus tells them, or the, the Father tells Israel, he said, I'm going to send my angel before you and make sure you do whatever he says because you don't want to make him mad. That's in my terms, but that's what he said. And so, verse 19, the angel answering said unto him, he said, you know, basically he said, do you know who I am? He said, I am Gabriel. And I stand in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And he said, I have been sent to speak unto you and to give you good tidings, glad tidings. And he said, I'll tell you what, you're standing here and by your mouth, you are killing what God needs to be released. So he said, behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because you believeth not my words and they shall be fulfilled in their season. 
And to everyone, hallelujah, who has not believed that God has released a prophetic utterance in the atmosphere, can I tell you, God is still going to perform what he has declared over this nation, over the church, hallelujah. There is a season that the Lord is going to fulfill it. And so the Lord said, I'll tell you what. Zachariah, he said, I'm going to make you mute because you are killing what you prayed for. In that moment, God shut the mouth of the priesthood so it wouldn't kill the fruit of the womb that held the prophet that was going to bridge two dispensations. Jesus could not come unannounced. What we're seeing in this hour is the Lord has given us sound bites that are announcing, get ready, there's something coming that is prophetic, that is dynamic, that is supernatural, that is declarative. It is the demonstration of heaven. And what the Lord is saying, now, is there anybody that will declare with me, uh, God, it doesn't matter how old I am, how broke I am, how sick I am, how uncovered I am, uh, if you said it, I believe it, that the word of God will be performed and it will not return it to him void. There is prophetic utterance that's been released over your life. You need to get a hold of it and tell God, I'm coming into agreement with what you have said over me. Well, Jensen Franklin preached at Robert Morris's. I didn't hear this personally, but I forget. Somebody told me this. And, of course, Brother Robert, he's the greatest Bible teacher you'll ever hear. But, you know, he's quiet. He talks. Jensen Franklin's preaching, and, and he looked at the crowd there, and, you know, they're not quite used to him in the face. And he says, now, calm down. He said, teachers talk and preachers yell. He said, you'll be all right. So sometimes I talk, but most of the time I yell. But you're going to be all right. <clears throat> So John, um, when he's born, the Bible said that he is not only preparing the way of the Lord, and I'd never seen this before, but in, in verse 17 of Luke 1, it says he's also making ready a people prepared for the Lord. You know what's in this room tonight? It is prophetic that has prepared people for the coming of God. There always has to be a prophetic release before the apostolic can come onto the scene. So John comes onto the scene. And one of the, what really started this whole teaching in me was Jesus came out of a virgin womb, and John came out of a barren womb. And it just kind of began to roll over my spirit in prayer, and I began to jot things down. Um, Elizabeth was old, but she wasn't a virgin. She had known the pleasures of a man, but not the joy of a child. And the womb had never produced fruit. And it's, it's difficult to pray for fruit when you look at your life and you only see barrenness. How many have understood that? You've been there. See, tonight, I look at fruit. But for so many years... I preached to a barrenness. I mean, this is, this is one of the best Sunday crowds we'd ever had right here. <laughs> so God is bringing John onto the scene, but it's a completely, he is coming out of a completely natural union. He is born out of the flesh. 
He is born out of the womb that has already known flesh, but has never produced fruit. And this is why God is bringing an end to that dispensation, because the law never produced fruit. It produced failure. That's why the thousands of animals had to be killed all the time because there was so much sin being committed in, in the Israelites' life because they were born out of the flesh. You say, then how could John do what he did? Because the Bible said that he was filled with the Holy Ghost when he was in his mama's womb. And I, I don't know when it happened, but this is when I think it happened. The Bible said that Mary or Elizabeth is six months pregnant and little teenage Mary shows up pregnant. And when Mary salutes Elizabeth and the voice of the mother of Jesus is heard, the scripture says that John the Baptist did a somersault or a flip inside the womb of Elizabeth. And I think that was the moment, hallelujah, that the Holy Ghost, because there was a union, there was a proximity. They were still in the womb, but they were in the same room. And the anointing, hallelujah, of Jesus, even in infant states. See, if Jesus had been in our day, he'd have been aborted. Because he was, Mary was like 14 and she wasn't married. So even a lot of Christians would have said, well, you know, for the sake of the mother, you need to abort the child. I was listening to Andrew Womack and uh, he was talking about, he said, from the moment of conception, it's no longer about the mother. It's about the child. You know, you should have thought about that before you hopped into bed. And so John is, he's birthed out of a barren womb. And so he's not divine, but the hand of God is on him. In fact, the scripture says this, that, um, that people, when they saw John's ministry, they wondered if he was Christ. Because there was, some, there was something unusual about his ministry. No wonder Jesus said there never been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. One of the ways that John was making crooked paths straight and filling up the low places and bringing down the mountains was his prophetic ministry as a last prophet. And the reason he was so powerful is because Jesus said he was Elijah. Not in the physical sense, but he had the mantle of Elijah on him. He had the anointing of Elijah on him. And he comes into the scene and he begins to release the word. But the way that he is correcting or the making the people ready and he is dealing with crooked paths is he goes after the religious system in Israel that is full of hypocrisy. That's what he went after. He went after the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. He called them vipers. He told them, he said, show me some fruit for repentance. And they hated him. And he begins to release the prophetic unction of God. And, and, um, and it's powerful. And, you know, John had to be a normal man. I mean, not real normal. He, he's eating locusts and wearing skins and you know he's um him and jesus were similar in the sense that both of them were raised without a father uh, both of them came out of the wilderness to start their ministry and so uh, you know but john you know he's seeing huge crowds that are coming to him and they you know what it tells me that the the system of the temple and the Pharisees were so dry and so dead 
that when somebody showed up that had some life, they generated such a hunger that people were coming by the hundreds and the thousands. Same thing with Jesus. It said crowds thronged him and it made the Pharisees mad. That tells me ain't nobody going to church in the temple because it was boring. Then you stick a wild man out on the side of a mountain. He begins to speak just repentance, and they're coming by the thousands, and they're getting baptized in the River Jordan. And what's he doing? He is preparing the way for, the, for a Christ ministry. And then he begins to realize. See, I think that we have been in a John the Baptist time in the church right now and in the nation and in the earth. And the greatest focus has really been on, on what prophets have been saying. And, you know, you have crazy prophets and then you have good prophets. And this is why you need discernment. You have to be able to discern in your spirit what God is saying. And um, so, you know, John, one day he begins, he begins to realize he sees Jesus, and he realizes, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sins of the world. And when he got around him, he said, Oh, I need to decrease, that he might increase. See, John prophesied the future, but Jesus fulfilled it. We can't forever live in a realm of John the Baptist to where we just always are saying, God's going to, God's going to, God's going to. It's like the boy that cried wolf one too many times. Somewhere, God, I told the Lord, I said, I don't need you to declare anything else. I need you to demonstrate what you have already declared. And I, I'm not saying that arrogantly to the Lord because I understand who I'm talking to, but I also need to see God fulfill what he has said. How many want to see that? Hallelujah. And it is the demonstration of the word being fulfilled that will save the sinner. And so he begins to say this. He said, I have to decrease that Christ would increase. And then, you know, his, his righteousness got him in trouble, and he prophesies to the wrong person and really makes them mad. He's talking about sexual immorality and Herodias. Um, you know, she's living with uh, a man that shouldn't be living with, and, and John confronts that thing head on. And... We know in the process that John's head is cut off. And just before he is going to die, he sends his disciples to Jesus. And he said, he must have had a low point. He was doubting himself. And he wondered, he said, go ask him, is he the one? Is he the one? And, of course, Jesus, you know, um, he looked at him and he said, you go tell John that I am demonstrating what he prophesied. I'm healing the blind. I'm raising the dead. I'm, you know, I'm uh, healing lepers and, and having great meetings. And, you know, the disciples are standing there going, well, I'm sure that's not what he wants to hear. Because a John the Baptist ministry doesn't move in the miraculous. John never did one miracle. He prophesied, but he was a bridge to connect one generation with what was getting ready to come forth. So I'm going to hurry along here because we're already 20 minutes till. Um, when John... They go back to him, and as they're getting ready to leave, Jesus, uh, when they walked away so they couldn't hear him, he said, or he did tell them this. He said, you tell John, blessed is he who is not offended in me. You're going to have to learn, as we all do, 
that there are seasons in your life that you're just going to have to walk it out by faith. And you're going to have to not be offended in the Lord. Yesterday, I stood beside the bed of one of our people in our church, a younger lady. Her arm is gone from here down, got cut off in an ATV accident, and it's gone. And when I stood over the bed with her and I prayed with her and we did communion, she said, when I came to pastor, I just, the first thing I remember was you talking about God's going to grow limbs out again. And I thought, Lord, you ain't never going to have a better opportunity than right here. <laughs> but when the bad things happen, you can't be offended. Because you don't know the final outcome. Basically, he told John, you did what I birthed you to do. Die in faith. And John died. And he prepared the way for Christ. Now, Jesus, when he came into the earth, he came out, not out of a barren womb, but he came out of a virgin womb that had never known man because he could not have a natural father because what he was getting ready to do was not natural, but it was divine. The Holy Ghost was his father. The Bible said the Holy Ghost overshadowed the womb of Mary. And what's so good about this is when you read Zacharias' response, it's, I don't think this can happen. And he can't talk for nine months until the baby's born. And then the Bible said he, they opened his mouth. And this time it wasn't. Well, I'm not sure. The Bible said he began to praise the Lord. He had nine months to build some praise up in him. But when the angel begins to speak to Mary and tell her that, she, he said, you're going to have a baby. Here's this little darling 14, 13-year-old girl. She's never been with a man but she said, be it unto me as thy word has spoken. And in that womb, hallelujah, God gets in a virgin womb and births Christ. And when Christ comes on the scene, hallelujah, he is not coming prophesying. John has already fulfilled that. Jesus came to fulfill what had already been spoken. I truly believe this, that in 2023, we are shifting from a John the Baptist ministry to a Christ ministry that no longer are we going to by faith say it, Lord, be it unto me. We are going to see the demonstration of the spirit. Paul said, I don't come to you with fancy words, but I come to you in the power and in the demonstration of the spirit. James said, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. We are in a season, hallelujah, where there is a Christ anointing that Jesus has been loosed in the atmosphere. So when, when, you, uh, when you go back and you, and you begin to, to, re, to look at the, the ministry of Christ, what makes it so good is flesh was not Christ's father. The reason the Lord God used a virgin womb is because it never known flesh. One of the reasons that there has been so little fruit in the church is because the church has had a barren womb that's known flesh. We've seen a lot of flesh, but we've not seen any spirit. 
And whenever Christ begins to emerge, one of the first things that has to happen is the I in the church has to die. I must decrease. He must increase. And so now we're seeing this resistance in the church of a lot of old wineskins that are so used to being top dog and I, but there's not any fulfillment. There's not any demonstration of the spirit. We don't need any more books written. What we need, hallelujah, is a fulfillment of what John has declared out of the virgin womb of a church. And so the Lord has overshadowed the house. And that out of us, there's something being released. It's a Christ anointing that's not coming from men. And so Jesus comes on the scene and what he's doing is he's no longer declaring what shall be. He is fulfilling what's already been declared. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law. He said, I came to fulfill it. He said, man has never been able to fulfill the law because they've not had the power of Christ in them. So he said, I have come, hallelujah, and I'm going to dwell in you. That my nature that is going to come inside of you is going to give you the ability to live above sin. You know, and uh, Jesus is so amazing. He has so many patterns and um, he picks uh, the forerunner that starts his ministry. His name is John. And then again, he picks a man that chronicles the last of his ministry and the last of the church, and his name is John. He starts with a John, ends with a John. He likes patterns. So Christ, when he comes on the scene, he was a prophet. The scripture calls him a prophet. Of course, men thought he was a prophet, but it was just because he could move in the prophetic. But he was the Messiah. But whereas John came out of priesthood, and he is the last prophet, and he's bringing an end to that era. When he prepared the way for the Lord, Jesus steps over into that. And the Bible said, where priesthood ended with the Old Testament, Hebrews says, Christ became our high priest. He was fulfilling it. So I believe that what we're getting ready to see prophetically, and we're already beginning to see God do some amazing things, is we are no longer in a season where God is just going to, for the next year, go, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. I think the John ministry is coming to an end. I, I, I don't think there's going to be that much emphasis in the next several months, in the next couple of years, on prophecy like there was because Christ is shifting from prophetic to apostolic. And the apostle set in order. The apostle, hallelujah, began to release. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. This is real simple, but you have five-fold ministry. You have the little finger, which is the teacher, because he can get in your ear. You have the index finger, the ring finger, <clears throat> rather, which is the pastor because he marries people to Christ. You have the, uh, the middle finger, which is the longest one. That's the evangelist because he reaches the furthest out. And then you have the index finger, which is the prophet because he points. <laughs> then you have the thumb, which is the apostle because it's the only of the fivefold that can touch all the other ones. We've had over the years and the decades, we've had a particular of fivefold ministry have great focus on it. But for God to bring in the final harvest, 
We have to have the apostle. We have to have the apostolic, which is a combination of God using all of those to fulfill what he wants to do. And so I, I think that what God has been after is a virgin womb. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And of course, when you read the scriptures, he says this. He says in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So he's speaking in the spirit realm. But the harvest that has to come in cannot come out of flesh. This is why John, all he could do was repentance, which was death. And he never did any miracles because he was fulfilling. He was bringing to an end something that no longer needed to function because it was giving way to something else. This is the hour that we're going to see Christ lifted up in the earth. Hallelujah. Not I, but Christ in me. Hallelujah. And that day that they took John, put his head on that block, and he knew. He knew I'm dying. They're going to cut my head off. I think as he knelt there and he had his head over there, he was thinking, I did what God told me to do. You stay true to the Lord. Hallelujah. You let God be God and you be you. And you will be surprised at how much God will get in you. Hallelujah. Amen. Why don't you stand with me tonight? Amen. So, you know, today we don't have priesthood anymore. Christ is our priest. We don't have blood sacrifice because once and for all, he was our blood sacrifice. We don't have to, you know, go through all kinds of personal torture for our sins. Because he was. All he's looking for is people that have faith. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Why don't you just slip your hands up? Lord, I'm asking you. God, we just, this church is amazed at how faithful you are. But Lord, I'm asking you, God, to release a Christ anointing in this congregation. Oh, Lord, hallelujah, God, that, Lord, that you have shifted over into another dimension, that, Lord, you have loosed grace in the earth, and, God, where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. So, Lord, I pray, God, that now as you're beginning to open our mouths that have spoke doubt in the past, that, God, as our mouths are open, there's praise coming out. Hallelujah, Lord, that God, that we are coming out of a virgin womb. This last great move of the Lord is coming out that which has never been touched by flesh. God, never been sired by flesh. But, oh, Holy Spirit, that you have overshadowed us. God, that we have been overshadowed by the Holy Ghost as Mary was. And, God, that we are birthing the Christ in us. God, that the apostolic. Lord, I thank you that crooked paths have been made straight in the United States and high places have been pulled down and valleys have been filled in. And Lord, now there's just an easy, clear path for the spirit of God to move this year. Lord, we're grateful for that. We thank you for the word of the Lord. God, give us traveling mercies as we leave tonight. Bring everybody home safe. Give thy saints much rest. We will wake up in the morning refreshed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.